You may not have heard, it hasn't gotten quite enough press coverage, but Tuesday is election day. Really sneaked up on us this year. That's right, friends. On Tuesday, those of us who are willing and able will go to the polls. That is, those of us who are over 18, who are registered and so inclined, will go to the polls to elect our next leaders. And the government shall be upon their shoulders. And this year, as happens every four years, in addition to the local, state, and national leaders, we will also be voting as a people for the next president of the United States. Dun dun da dun dun da dun da dun da dun da. But if we're honest, this year it feels more like da 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 da. Dun, 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 dun. Whether we're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green, or Surprise Party, friends. <laughs> this year feels a little off. Not just because of the negativity of our current campaign, not just because of the inadequacies of our candidates, but because of us. In other words, something just doesn't feel different about this year, friends. Something is different. Us. Think of how we've changed over the last four years. Not just as individuals, though undoubtedly we have, but as a community, as a nation, as a world. Four years ago, to mention San Bernardino or Sandy Hook or Orlando or Charleston in the same sentence would have sounded like nice places to visit. Four years ago, most of us had never heard of ISIS or Aleppo or the refugee crisis. Most of us were unaware, perhaps sinfully so, of the racial tensions in Baltimore or Ferguson or Rochester, New York. Four years ago, we were starting campaigns to stop bullies. But things change. And here we are. I've received more requests in this past week to say something about the election than any other moment in my ministerial career. Some have asked that I tell people how to vote. I won't do that. Some people have asked that I sort out the chaos of our political system. I can't do that. Some have asked that I promise everything will be okay. Only God can do that. But there is something I can do, friends, or rather we can do together. That is to remind each other of the truth, of the hope of the gospel, that regardless of what happens on Tuesday, that regardless of who wins or loses, regardless of how we personally feel about it, our job will be the same on Wednesday as it is today. As people who declare Jesus Christ, who proclaim that name in this world, a man who asked us to do nothing more than love one another, our job on Wednesday will be the same as it was last Wednesday, as it is today. In other words, our job today is the same as it was 2,000 years ago, as the same as it will be 2,000 years from now. Friends, as a people of faith, we are called to love one another. Full stop. That's it. Everything else 
is just white noise. And while that's easy to say on Sunday morning, it's hard to remember on Monday. Fortunately for us, we're not the first people to experience a little anxiety about the present moment. We're not the first in the history of our faith to look around our world and to say to ourselves, what is happening? Why are we treating each other the way that we're treating each other? Why are we saying the things that we say? Why are we allowing ourselves to get away with this? We're not the first people to want to hole up and pretend like the world is not how it actually is. In other words, we're not the first people to be scared. And as we know from experience, fear has a way of making us do some poor things to each other. To push others away, to try and build up ourselves, to try and create a wall between us and them, whoever us and them happens to be. But friends, it's hard to love your neighbor through a wall. And we need to come together every once in a while to remind ourselves that we are called to build bridges, not walls. We're called to reach across the aisle, to reach out a hand to one another, to find a way to communicate person to person, soul to soul, heart to heart. And the author of our scripture passage for today reminds us of that truth. Our passage for today comes from 2 Thessalonians, or as one of our presidential candidates might put it, 2 Thessalonians. It is a story that is written to a people who were anxious about their present moment, who were worried about the life in which they were existing, and they were thinking that this was the end, that it was all over, that Jesus was coming back. And they were willing to wait for that to happen. The first book of Thessalonians, the first letter written to that church in Thessalonica was written in 51 CE or thereabouts by Paul. And it was written promising them that Jesus would be coming soon. And so they took that as an excuse to rest on their laurels to say, well, yes, things are going poorly now, so let's just hang out and wait. The author of 2 Thessalonians, we don't think it was Paul, somebody else was writing to correct that attitude, to say you can't just sit there. The day of the Lord has not come. And the author says to that church, says, look, there are going to be other things that happen. There are going to be trials and tribulations. There will be one who rises up in deceit, who will be there and will seek a spot at the temple, confusing himself with God. And frankly, friends, that could fit any of our political candidates right now people who confuse themselves with the answer. This is not an apocalyptic vision offered by that author of Thessalonians. It's not a checklist that we simply go through and when we get to the end, we set a place at the table for Jesus. No, it's a reminder about what the day of the Lord actually is. It's that promise for the world which will come when we finally all live as Christ commanded, when we love our neighbor as ourselves. In other words, it's not looking to the clouds for Jesus, it's looking to the crowds for Jesus. That is, to each and every one of us as we figure out a way to embrace one another, regardless of whatever excuse we use to separate ourselves from each other. It's the promise of a better world, but the truth that we're not there yet. It doesn't take more than a cursory glance around our world to recognize that we have work to do, friends. And the author of 2 Thessalonians says to the people to whom he or she was writing that you are the first fruits of salvation 
that if you're looking for Jesus to come into this world, then you have work to do, that we are the body of Christ for the world. We're the vanguard of Christ's promise of love, that if we don't love, how can we expect others to do it? He says, hold true to those traditions that you have in your life. Hold on to the truth. Keep proclaiming it. Remember that which you were taught. Perhaps that's the message we need to hear on this All Saints Sunday, that there are people who have come before us who have proclaimed the truth and told it well enough to get us to this moment today. But friends, now it's our chance to take it forward, to keep moving the ball down the field. The pew in which you're sitting in, someone else has sat. The door in which you entered this morning, someone else has come through. The pulpit in which I'm standing right now, someone else has preached in much better than me. And if we can remember that, friends, then we can have hope because all of those people, as you look back through the history, have made it through times of anxiety. Our church has been around for 196 years, not just in this spot, but in locations around this city. And there are, as you look back through times of trial and tribulation, we've made it through the Civil War and two world wars and the war on terror, and here we sit. And we each have our own anxieties, our own frustrations, our own fears today. Some of us are more anxious than others, but we have an example of those who have come before us and who have shown us the way. However imperfectly, they have found their way. Over 196 years together, we have worshiped, we have sung, we have celebrated with one another, and we have cried. We've been in it together. If we were to take a video, a time-lapse video, and just pause it right now and rewind it back through the years, we would see not only changes in fashion and the aging of ourselves, but we would see all of those who have come before us, who have managed to pause in moments of anxiety and find their way together. But there is something that would be missing from that photograph from that video, the work of the gospel. Friends, the work that we are called to do doesn't just happen within these four walls. We come here to be refreshed, to find our way, to remember what it is that we're about, to have someone remind us of what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves, but then we leave this place. Whether this is our first Sunday or after this sermon, our last, this is a place that we come to recognizing that we need some help for the journey, that there will come a moment in our lives when we are scared of what is going on in our world, and we need someone who, when we want to shove other people away, to remind us that the only time Jesus is asked, who is my neighbor in the gospel, he responds with the parable of the Good Samaritan, that is, about a foreigner from a different faith and says, go and do likewise. Sometimes we need reminders of what it means to love, of who it is that we are called to love. When we want to shove each other away, we need someone to push us together. That is who we are for one another. Look around, friends. There are Republicans and Democrats. There are Trump supporters and Clinton supporters and undoubtedly people who are still feeling the burn. But more than anything else, this is a place that is filled with people who are trying their best to find their way towards life together. And the good news of the gospel is that we don't do it alone. We never know what a day is going to bring. We may be anxious about Tuesday, but the truth is we have no guarantee of Monday. We don't even know what this afternoon will hold. All we know is that we have right now. And in this moment, we can choose life or not. Next week, if we make it that far, some of us will be celebrating and others of us will be mourning. But all of us will still have the same mission we had today.
the same mission placed before us 2,000 years ago, to love one another. So if you're looking for advice about how to vote, vote with your heart. What else can you do? Vote for the person that you think will help you love your neighbor as yourself, but make no mistake, friends. Making this world a better place is not a job for our politicians. It's a job for us. And so on Tuesday, as with every day, let us all choose love. Fortunately, we don't have to register for that. Thanks be to God. Amen.